thoughts are coming from. The whole box? Yeah. Hey, Linda, how you been doing? Don't laugh at me. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> it's all right. How's, how's everything been going? You know what? Things are going tolerably well. I really don't have any complaints. I'm still working from home. Oh, that's a good thing. Yeah, you know, um, I um took my crazy dogs to the dog park yesterday. And um my blue pit, they actually did really good, but this one dog popped up and he decided he wanted to be just a tad bit aggressive. So my blue pit had to um, show his fangs and let him know you might be bigger than me, but wow. I can bite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so everything is okay. You know, I'm just um, taking it one day at a time. How, how are things with you? Uh, everything's going pretty good. Um, 
We might have a, a few more people that can come in tonight. I really, Good. I changed the name of the group to the uh, reentry uh, virtual support group. Okay. I've been getting a lot of interaction in a lot of different uh, the prison reform groups on Facebook. Mm -hmm. A lot of people been uh, hitting me up, asking me about the group and you know the, the, the join and stuff like that. So hopefully it'll start building. I, uh, working on a podcast. I'm starting. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I'm gonna do me a podcast. So I'm kind of excited about That's some things. Great. So you know everything just been going good. Just continuing the mission. That's good that's the main thing continuing the mission good um have you heard of this mag this online magazine called Re um returning citizens uh, uh okay i'm going to send you that information um the gentleman who is the um coo of the magazine his name is patrick foreman if okay. you google him you'll find him he also is um a gospel singer and he has this online magazine specifically for um, people um, who are formerly incarcerated. And also I'll send you um, information for fail error here in Fredericksburg. Um, okay. the, lady, the lady who owns that, her um, that's her mission as well. Okay. So I'll send you their information and you can reach out to them and let them know that I, you know, wanted to just connect the two of you all together. All right, that'll work. So yeah, that most definitely work. I did a uh, a radio interview the other day with uh oh, Ricky mm -hmm. Ricky Jones out of Harlem. Uh huh. Uh, How was it? It was it was pretty good. It, it was it was real good. Uh, I I met him in one of the uh, prison groups. Oh the, okay. Yeah. So yeah, that was pretty good as well. So I think everything's been going good. Um, I got I got a meeting with a guy. He see my he see my stuff. You know what I do. He got some nonprofit for um people that's getting out of prison and get right back on track. Mm -hmm. I had a meeting with him Monday because he wants to implement my uh I do workshops. Mm -hmm. so, uh a re-entry workshop. So he wants right. to have a meeting to try to implement me, me coming down at least once a week mm -hmm. and doing my work and doing my workshops. Uh, so my workshops, I told about I, if I do the whole workshop. I mean, just continuously go through the whole workshop. It's a two-day workshop. Okay. But if we really want to break down and, you know, and really work with people, then it, mm -hmm. it, it turns in. Oh, so we got a couple of people waiting. We got one person waiting right now. For the mm -hmm. And so um, I told him if, I, if we do it to where we actually working on it, mm -hmm. then it, I, I, it can be a four to six months program. But Absolutely. it's really worth it because... The things that we're addressing, like I like I always tell people, you can come out of prison and you can they can offer you that you can get the housing, mm -hmm. you can get the transportation, you can get all the, the resources and everything. But if you ain't prepared mentally, yeah, buddy, none of that matters. You know, because I was on the phone with a parole officer a couple of weeks ago, and she was telling me they are it's here in Missouri, that mm -hmm. they are the uh they got the, the state, the, the state has implemented a new program for probation and parole, and they basically the guinea pigs for it. So they get it first to see how it goes. Mm -hmm. And if you if you're on pro or uh, parole and you got a high substance abuse problem, mm -hmm. they put you in this program, they help you find housing, they get you a phone with minutes, they give you an extra five hundred dollars a month, just you know, just that have basically she said. She said they also uh they help you they help you uh find a job, get groceries. All mm -hmm. you gotta do is go to the classes and you gotta take like eight or nine U UAs a month. Mm -hmm. She said people don't even show up for the classes. That's don't great. even show up for the council sessions or nothing. Mm. But you know what? I, and as as you were speaking, and I want to talk to you about this offline. I just had an idea of something I think that you would be really, really successful at as far as broadening your audience. So right. after this is off, give me a quick call because I, I, I was just like, oh, yeah, because nobody else. I haven't seen anybody else do this thing. OK, nobody. Yeah. And, it, and I mean, it literally just popped in my head as you were talking. So I want to talk to you offline after this um, session tonight. Exactly. 
Yeah, man. So how you doing, Denise? Uh, we like to welcome you to the uh, reentry support group. Uh, we are building this group. This group is fairly new. Uh, me and Linda, we've been in this group. It's really been really us two. And Rob, <laughs> I don't know where Robin's at, but she might pop in here and there. But uh, right. yeah. so we on the uh, we on the verge of building the group. Um, mm -hmm. Just like I've been saying in the uh, Facebook group, Denise, that we built in this group for a support group for people to come home from prison or that's been out of prison and they're running into obstacles. If we build the group big enough, we'd be able to build a bigger and stronger network. So if somebody's going through something, we have somebody in the network that's been mm -hmm. through it and can tell you how to navigate through it. Exactly. And if you look for resources and we have somebody in a group that's in your area, they can show you how to get to the resources and help you find the places in your area that you need the resources mm -hmm. that, you know, because I mean, with this, it's all out there, you know, um, I got an ultimate goal that I'm really working on. Uh, I just got to find me a tech person. If I find a tech person, we willing to work side by side. I got something, um, I got an idea that's, I think is going to be a major, major plus, you know? And so I, was, I got the podcast, first interview for the podcast coming up Monday. Okay. Uh, if you're my, if you're my uh, re entry support group on Facebook, that's where it's going to be airing at. Monday night, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Central Time, uh, with, with a guy named Michael Moreau, Michael Pistol Moreau. <laughs> he got the story. <laughs> he, uh, he, was, <laughs> he, uh, he went to the feds on the uh, drug kingpin charge. He was one of mm -hmm. the, he, he got pardoned through a, when Obama was pardoning people, you know. And he, uh, one thing he stuck, stuck out with me, he said, Man, you want to know what a humbling experience is? You said I went from making at least forty thousand dollars in drug profits a week when I was wow. in the drug game. He says when I got out of prison, I had to work at McDonald's making seventy two dollars and twenty five cent an hour. Whoa. He talking about you talking about a humble experience. So I mean, it's, it'd be a good thing to tap in with it because we're gonna be talking about money management, money problems, and money management. Oh my God, you are reading, you are like so, <laughs> get out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's, what we're gonna, that's the topic. So, cause what the podcast is gonna do is gonna break down, each podcast is gonna have different topics that you might face okay. with, with re-entry. So we know one of the biggest problems when we get out, when people get out is money. Yeah. Money problems. Even if you get a job, you might have fines, child support, yeah. other things that you have to pay and you, and if you don't know how to manage your money or how to budget or mm -hmm. you're I you start thinking and start using criminality as exactly. an option, I'm gonna go back to you know, I'm gonna go back to doing this. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have him on there because I'm I want people to hear how did how what did you know how he didn't go back because you gotta think about making forty thousand dollars a week. Yeah, but, you know, he did 10 and a half years. So he got out, but before he went in, you talking about forty thousand a week to working at McDonald's. So that not only that takes some discipline, but but it also has to be like I got a big. I know my purpose. I know what I'm. I come out here to do exactly. You know to to be that humble. So we, we, I'm really gonna dig. <laughs> I'm gonna dig into the mind of him, man, and you know oh, to see, you know great. exactly what was his thoughts and mm -hmm. you know how how was he feeling. I mean, because he was like uh people that knew him. When he was in the streets, when he was working mm -hmm. at McDonald's, he said they would come in and just like treat him like an artifact, like right, yeah. like for real. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to that, and I think um, it would be a good episode, my very first episode for the podcast, mm -hmm. and I think it was the best way to go with money because that's really the the, the main thing of getting out, trying to you know provide for yourself at the right. same time. You might have restitution, child support, other fines, you know. And then if you transition it from a uh, like a halfway house, and you you don't have no family, and you're gonna try to get to get money to you know. So it's gonna take some budgeting. It's gonna take yep. some money management, and a lot of other things to be able to do that. So that I, I'm really looking forward to it. That's great. So yeah. So that's all I've been working on, really. Mm -hmm. uh, Revamping, revamping the whole, re, not necessarily revamping, but making everything, leveling it up, you mm -hmm. know, 
make, making everything just good. Because my overall goal was to build a big community for mm -hmm. people that's getting out of prison, a, a, a nationwide network. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like like how Facebook's a, na a nationwide uh, network, a worldwide network. Mm -hmm. Just call mm -hmm. a nationwide network of people that's getting out of prisons, uh, resources, uh, agencies, and things like that, to where when someone gets out of prison, we're able to take them up under their wing. We, you got a whole group of mentors that can be able to mentor you, mm -hmm. understand what you're going to, what you're going through. Because I was telling the PO, like, y'all job is to do y'all job. I said, then counselors, I said, but a, a lot of times, y'all, mostly all the time, can't relate to getting out of prison. Right. You know, and having to face what you have in the face. But if you got, if I got a big community of people that been there and, and have gone through it and know how to navigate to be successful, mm -hmm. then when people get out of prison, they can come in this group. And if it's someone right there in their area, they can, you know, connect with, and they, instead of having to go all these places trying to find these resources, they can get pointed exactly to the people that's really going to help you. The people exactly. that's really going to give you the resources, not give you the runaround. I'm totally like, P.O., y'all give people the runaround. They give me these places, and a lot of times they be runaround. They mm -hmm. don't be places that be sincerely helping. They just be places that y'all be in partnership with that they just, you know, we in partnership with probation and parole. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we want the resources that's really going to help us. You well, know. you know, the one thing that I found out is, um, and I just did this by Googling, I found pages and pages of these companies that um, have a really good reputation as it relates to hiring ex-felons. And I was really surprised by some of the major companies, you know, I mean, like multi, multi-million dollar companies that um, hire ex-felons. So it's really just a matter of um, you got to do the research, and even as you're speaking, you can um, we can talk about them more offline. There's a way to find out um, who was the major um, player in each. What I want to say, each major city. For instance, like in Chicago, one of the places where um, ex fellas can go is this place called the Safer Foundation. They've been around for a long, long time. So you have these major companies or businesses like that in major cities. You just need to get, once you get the name of those um, entities and then find out, well, who do you partnership with? Let's just say for the state of Illinois. So now you've got a running list for, for Illinois. And then as you continue to build on, you know, before you know it, you'll have like this huge, um, almost like telephone book, and I'm just using that, you know, of information, whereas people can kind of just go put in their state and all of what they need to find out as far as contacts, et cetera, et cetera, will be right there in their state. So that is absolutely doable. Yeah. And I mean, and so, yeah, that's the overall goal. Yeah. Um, this not not just with the group, but even outside the group. Yeah. Like, uh, that's why I said I'm I'm want to get with like a tech person. Mm -hmm. so I'm not about no app building nothing like that, but creating an app that will put all of this into one. So if mm -hmm. you're getting out of prison, I mean you're gonna have to learn how to use a phone. And you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time on their phone. So now you download the app and you say, okay, I'm in this area. Right. These are the people that's uh in this, uh, these are the people that's on the app that's in my area, mm -hmm. that's been through what I've been through, that I can connect with, that can mentor mm -hmm. me. These are also the places where I can get the, the resources, the, the strong mm -hmm. resource places that I know, or you know, they really are going to help and they really want to do it. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I really want to get with a tech person and build a re-entry app that you know puts all it together like a big network. When you get out or if you, somebody contacts you like, I'm from California, then you know, you know, they can go to the, the app, mm -hmm. California, saying select the state, cities, and figure out, you know, saying people they can connect with even outside. Because a lot of times, you know what I'm saying, you don't want to get out and you, you don't feel comfortable just hanging with just any and everybody. Right. You know, you don't know who's who and 
you know, and they ain't never been to prison, so you kind of feeling, but you got somebody like, yeah, man, I've been through your shoes, man. This, exactly. You know, you, we can meet I, up. Um, I know for my study, I planned on, in my last chapter, when mentioning future implications, mm -hmm. I was going to mention mentorship because one of my participants actually said that, you know, that it would help if yeah. they had some mentors, people who could relate, who they could relate to and could relate to them. And because he was the only person who mentioned it, of course, during my coding and analysis, that uh, mentorship is not something that's going to come up as being a major factor. Mm -hmm. And I already, um, I already told her that, but I'll just let you know that I'm doing a dissertation study. Oh, and it's Denise, actually, hey! <laughs> And it's actually on uh, the reentry challenges of formerly incarcerated African American men in Louisiana. Yeah. And um, and I told him I said I'm really passionate about the topic because a lot of them feel like that they that our communities lack resources mm -hmm. and that there are some out there, but our people don't know anything about it. Right. And um, another thing that you know. Uh, Be passionate about. It, it really goes deeper than, than the fact that there, it, it really goes deeper than what we see on the surface yeah. as far as, because I'm actually using um, the critical race theory mm -hmm. uh, for mine, because I understand the racial disparities across various institutions, you know, with the healthcare system, all of these things tie into the criminal justice system. It don't matter which one you pick at so in one way or another, they all lead to the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I just think it's much bigger than that. And there are other issues that we really need to tackle um, as far as fixing a system. I don't think it's broken. I think it's designed to do what it was meant to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that, I mean, it's doing exactly what it was designed to do. And I just feel like it's a system that really needs to be dismantled, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Yeah. Um, so you, that is something like I'm really I'm really passionate about the reentry because I just thought it was really shocking that there were no studies on um, even as far as our statistics in Louisiana, they have statistics on recidivism rates, let's say for juveniles and um, they have one for a gerontology session mm -hmm. uh, section women because they call those special populations mm -hmm. and they have it for like, uh, let's say whites and blacks men and women, but they don't keep up. They don't keep the stats for um, the re the recidivism rates for African American males. Mm -hmm. And when I called and I asked the uh, executive director, "Why don't we have that information?" He said, "Unfortunately, in Louisiana, we don't keep up with that." So I asked him again, "Why?" He wanted to know why I needed it. Okay, well, <laughs> if the, if your habitual offender rate is higher for African Americans, more specifically African American males, mm -hmm. and Louisiana has carried the highest incarceration rate for nearly two decades, and we're only second to Oklahoma now, and, and when I say second, I don't mean we're far behind. So right. why is it nobody would want to know what's the problem? And I think it's because we know what the problem is. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, that's why I'm 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 just really passionate about that, and you know, and I understand with these resources, and and that's great. I just feel like it's it's much much deeper than that. There are issues that really really need to be tackled, and really really need to be um, disseminated in a way to where it can uh, inform policy. You know, reach the people who are making these policies that are not for us. Yeah, mm. yeah, I'll and because it affects our families and all right. of that. When our men are taken out of our communities, it affects them, and you throw them back out here where there's little resources in these communities. Some of them don't even have, uh, you know, familial support. It, you know, what it does to their relationship with their kids when they've been incarcerated for so long, and they have they have a strange relationship with their kids, mm -hmm. and and that's hard, you know. And then, I mean, thinking about, you know, just their mental state when they get out. As a man, they have this thing, this need to provide. And when you take that away from them, yes. how that makes them feel because they have to go live with a sister or they have to, before they leave out, they have to come in contact with some woman that they're probably not even that interested in. But hey, exactly. she can provide me with a place to stay. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just what it does. And then when you get out there, you, it's almost like you have to trade in your dignity mm -hmm. to live the way that they f feel like you should live, if that makes sense, you know? What you make, what you say the underlying dictates you how to live. Yes. Yeah, you really do have, it's like you have to throw away your dignity. You mm -hmm. have to throw away what makes you feel like a man to have to go into a situation where you have to rely on people to take mm -hmm. care of you because you're not on your feet. You don't even know when you'll be on your feet. Um, the way people look at you when you go up, it, you know, people say second chance, second chance, second chance. And then I go to jail for drugs. But then if I go apply for a job here, you're looking at me like I want to rob the place. Mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. like I'm trying to do you harm. I right. just want a job. That's it. But you know, this is why it's really, really important to teach people how to think outside of the box. Yes. Um, a friend of mine, her son, he got caught at the airport with a gun. And yeah, I know. I, I, okay. <laughs> at a major airport. Um, I don't know why he was there with it, but he ended up doing 17 years. Um, Fortunately for him, when he was released, he had a really good home base to come home to, but he had also um, put in the work he needed to do while he was incarcerated to learn some various trades so that when he did get out, he was able to do something. And now he's running his own um, cross country moving trucking business, you know. Um, but a lot of times, even when it comes down to the economics with the money, and I was thinking about it earlier today, I was listening to the interview that, uh, wait, let me get it right, Ice Cube, <laughs> he was having with some of the ladies in California about this, you know, this whole economic thing for black people, what have you. And I'm like, the bottom line is that it goes back to economics 100. If you don't know the basics, Mm -hmm. about economics and how to take care of your money, then you can go from being on in, incarcerated to having $100 million. You're going to blow it because you don't know what to do with it. So it's those basic skills that a lot of our brethren, they just need. And even if they've had it before, it's, it's, it, it's okay. Let's do some refresher courses so we, we can keep you in remembrance of you need to do this in order to do this, because if you do it this way, you're setting a solid foundation and you'll be able to hold on to it. Uh, Linda, it's like this. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. If you can go back to childhood traumas, right? Yes, that too. And, and our experiences, they shape the way we perceive things. Mm -hmm. You know, so here's another thing. The things that other races teach their kids that as black people, we we were not taught. When I was a child, I wasn't taught about credit. Mm -hmm. I've been in the schools where I've heard some white boys say, I'm not going to college. And you know why they're not going? Because mm -hmm. their family own farming, own land. These kids already know about agriculture. They've been doing right. it since they were six or seven. And that's what's waiting for them. They already have land that's bought and paid for. Mm -hmm. They already have money being made. Their parents already knew. Get a credit card. Put your child on that credit card. As long as you're paying on it, your child credit is going up. Mm -hmm. You know how many of our people that don't know about these things and mm -hmm. we can't blame our parents because they didn't know. Exactly. They didn't know. And so the, they, they teach their kids about all of these things. Mm -hmm. Their kids know this stuff already. And they, they know more than what, you know, the average black person. I mean, and I mean, adults. Exactly. That we exactly. know they, they've been taught these things ever since they were little. And here we are as adults and we're just figuring this out because we're learning to research on our own mm -hmm. because there's so much, you know, with technology now that we have that our parents did not have. Right. So we're, we're able to go and Google this stuff and research this stuff and figure this stuff out on our own. And so when people are about brought up in a certain situation, that's that's all they know. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like if you think about Tarzan, when a, when a person is raised by wolves, a child is raised by wolves or any other like. animals, what you expect them to act like? Exactly. You know what I'm saying? They, they don't that's they're doing what they know.
That's, where That's what they know. And even when you try to tell them better, and it's frustrating because they're not getting it. It's not that they don't want to get it. It, it's just like me and you, if we've been taught a certain thing all of our life, mm-hmm. how you think you're just going to come tell me something different and I'm going to accept it right away. Mm-hmm. It, it doesn't work like that. The, it yeah. takes time. And you have to, sometimes you just have to meet people where they are. Exactly. Yeah. You did, because I know I used to be like that. You talk, I mean, I ain't trying to hear it. Right. I'm focused on what in the, in the situation and the position that I'm stuck in. I don't, I don't know nothing about that. I'm really not... Mm-hmm. I'm not feeling that. I'm not trying to hear it. Mm-hmm. What I do know, if I go do this right now, I'm going to have that. I'm going to have this. Mm-hmm. And right well, tell now, me what y'all think about this. Somebody told me, they said, to be honest with you, I think doing this for adult, me- adult males, I think you might as well just throw that away because that situation is dead. They was like, that, that situation is dead ass. That's what they said. You may as well focus on the youth. Now, I worked in a juvenile detention center for seven years. They mm-hmm. say you might as well focus on the youth because that's where it's at. Grown men, you can give that up. We're already dead. That's what he said. But this was my take on it. I said, I understand what you're saying. But if I consider y'all dead, now I'm I'm just going to put this out here. Like I told him and I don't tell any of them. Hey, you can count yourself out if you want to, but that's not me. That's not what I'm going to do. Because mm-hmm. first of all, you're going to fight your battles all the way, all through the day. But when you get to the end of it, I'm not going to be waiting there with my hands up, ready to box with you. That's not what I'm trying to do. Now, if you right. want me to fight with you, I will. But I'm not trying to sit up here and go against you. I'm not going to put you down. Mm-hmm. However you feel about yourself, that's how you feel about yourself. But I love you and ain't nothing you can do about it. But... <laughs> My thing is, you know, and I'm just straight up like that. But Mm -hmm. my thing is, no, I can't consider y'all dead because we still need y'all because we still got young men out here who need some men. So how am I going to throw y'all away and consider y'all dead and just say, hey, there's no need in us helping y'all because y'all are already gone. It is what it is. Y'all lost in the system. We need to be helping these kids or helping these juveniles who have been in detention centers because they really do get a second chance. Their stuff gets erased pretty much. So I'm like... No, we can't do that because they still need y'all. So how how am I going to consider y'all dead? How are we going to throw y'all away? How are we going to not help y'all get on your feet, get the things that you need? You know, when we know that there are some, we got a, a generation of boys dependent on you. Like, that was my take on it. Yeah, that that's my take as well. Because, I mean, that'd be like saying, that'd be like, oh, we got somebody, somebody trying to get in. Oh, but that'd be like me saying, I, I, I give up, you right. know, I done did my time. I give up. I'm not finna help nobody. I'm a lost cause. I already have been through the system on several occasions. And th- there's no, you know, just forget it. I ain't gonna, you know, no, nah, that ain't how that works. Once I got myself right, I had to reach back, not only to my peers, but to those that's looking up that really need me. Some, some young teenager is almost going through the things that I've been through and I can stop them with my guidance, with my knowledge and experience, like, look, man, I'm telling you, this is what I've been through, man. Mm-hmm. Just you know, being a mentor to that person, teaching them the things that I wasn't taught, like we was talking earlier, that I that we wasn't taught when we, you know, in and when we was growing up, credit, you know, right. uh, start entrepreneurship, just so many different things that I can breathe on him with. Right. So I, I wouldn't. I, yeah, I don't. I definitely don't agree with that because there's too many brothers that you know and have been through the system that we need in this fight, especially when we talk about raising young men that's already in a juvenile system at that. Well, one of the, one of the well, not one, but several experiences that I have had with men is, um, and this is just something that I just do on my own, is um, as a woman. Shut up and listen. Mm-hmm. Just listen. And it's not, I'm not necessarily talking about listening to every word that comes out of that man's mouth. But most importantly, what is he not saying? What is his body language telling you? And by doing that, I've got men who stood in front of me and cried like babies because of things that they dealt with when they were children, having been sexually molested, having been physically abused by 
family members, their own parents, what have you. And, you know, a lot of times these men, they just need somebody to listen to them and build them up. One of the things that um, I like about the Marine Corps is when a man or a woman goes into the Marines, I don't care who you think you are, they chop you down to nothing. But they do that in order to get away all of that garbage. And then they start rebuilding you on a much better and solid foundation so that you can stand and with withstand whatever storm is going to come your way. And we just have to, as a society, we've got to have more empathy and you just got to take the time to listen. Sometimes mm -hmm. just ask a question. And sometimes that one question will open up a river of doors where they will begin to talk. And from their conversation, now I can refer you to this or let me, okay, well, I, I don't know how to do this but let me hook you up with somebody who can do this. Or if I can do this, let me help you with this. Let me be able to show you that there is a better way. Because like mm -hmm. you said before, like both of you said, many of our people, they just didn't know. My, my parents didn't know. I learned about credit the hard way, you know, after I became a <laughs> yeah. I mean, I did. Uh, Which, yeah. Fortunately, I never, yeah. had, I never faced bankruptcy. But I learned the hard way, you know, about credit and what it takes to buy a home and, you know, all of this other stuff. So we just have to, I, I just really think that, you know, the mentoring is so, so important. And I don't even know how you could even, well, I mean, I have some ideas as to how we can start mentoring. But when it comes to these men, you just got to, sometimes you just got to be quiet and let them talk. Let them fuss, let them cuss. Okay. And I'm then, not judging you. Then us as men, though, after we do all the talking and fussing and all that, mm -hmm. we have to sit back and swallow our pride yes. and be able to listen as well. Yep. And, and be able to take advice. I mean, but like the guy, he feel like he probably he felt like he had lost, lost calls. So mm -hmm. anything that someone tried to tell him. It probably he don't probably you know it probably don't even pay no attention to he probably don't care because he already got his mind made up right he's reaching out for us we we lost calls Lord mm -hmm. getting hot you know but he you know so us as men we have to swallow that as well you know and sit back and you know take in what's being taught to us and what's and what's being bringing to the table to us a lot of times we don't we have the mentality and the mindset. And I don't want to hear it. Well, especially once we feel a certain way. Right. Like we shut down completely. Just shut down. Just yes. you don't say nothing, you know. Just uh, whatever. You know, I ain't got nothing to say no more. And we got to break that habit. Because in order for the, the, the it's going to take more than just women mm -hmm. to grow the youth. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. You can't just leave it all on one set of, one, one set of people. You yeah. can't on it. It's, it's going to take all of us. It's That's going to take right. those that have been through the rain, that have been through the fire, through the storms on both sides, and then grew up out of it. It's going to take all of us to reach in and work together to make this happen on mm -hmm. all levels. I might not know there's nothing about credit, but somebody I know might got the credit game down and can exactly. teach you down to a T to where you can understand it in our terms. And they, right. they able to do it. I don't, I may not know nothing about entrepreneurship, but I know somebody who knows it can break and teach you entrepreneurship in our terms. And that's what it takes. It's going to take a whole to, to make that happen, you know? And so I think that, I think it's real important. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I just can't agree with that statement that, um, you know, we, we're a lost cause. I don't, you know. I, I think that's yeah, He was saying kind of like, it's just a waste. He was like, like yeah. Just focus on the youth. He was like, it's a waste even, you know, even dealing with us. But I, I explained to him, he was like, wow. He was, I told him, I said, now I'm not fussing at you. That's probably just the mom in me that come out sometimes yeah. or whatever. <laughs> but I told him that that's just me. And he was like, no, 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 I need that. I need that. And so he actually, he was sitting and he was embracing it. And even now 
he'll text me and say, I just wanted to let you know that I'm having a good day and I went to check okay. on you or an hour, an hour, or I'll say good morning, sending positive vibes your way, you know, or whatever. But he was like, no, no, I needed that. I need somebody to get on me, you know, Have when I'm messing you? up. I need somebody to check me. <coughs> Have it's you ever read so the book, um, Solitary? Again? That? Have either of you read the book Solitary by Albert Wood Fox? No. no. Oh. Oh. Let me tell you. you need and you to said it's it. Albert Wood Fox? Yes, this man did over 40 years in solitary confinement down in Louisiana. Oh, wow. I gotta check that his, out. His, his, he said his, it was like living in a, what do you call it? A, um, a parking space for over 40 years. It's called Solitary by Albert um, Woodfox. I'm uh, telling you, it's wrong. He goes into a lot of detail. And I think any person, especially any African American man, when you coming out of prison, you need to read this man's autobiography of what he went through. This was back in the day in the state penitentiary in Louisiana. I see it. Yes, very good read. I'm not yeah, responsible if you can't put the book down. Yeah, I had to put, I'm gonna put that on my list. Yeah, very yeah. good read. And, I, and yeah, I think I think we had to it attack it. My part. <laughs> we had to attack it on all angles, you know. You and that's one thing that I hope that once we get things going with this reentry group, that we're gonna have. Okay, this Thursday we're gonna we're gonna have somebody on that's gonna break down credit. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be a must that you understand mm -hmm. credit coming out of. It. I ain't know nothing about. I, I didn't know nothing about credit for real until I started uh, being into entrepreneurship and stuff like mm -hmm. that over the within the last three years since I've been on. Mm -hmm. Prior to me, uh, prior to then, I credit was nowhere. <laughs> I wasn't tripping to worry about no credit, right. you know. But over the last three years, I you know came to an understanding of how credit works and everything mm -hmm. else, and been building my credit. My credit. It didn't that I had a lot of uh, negative accounts. I'm like, I just didn't have no accounts. Right. Know? I've been I've been in the streets the majority of my life, so right. I ain't had no bills in my name. I ain't never had a car payment. I didn't have a car payment until I got out of prison. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, I just buy buy cars, or I just never I had nothing that was building credit for me. So right. no credit is just reversing and having bad credit. It is. It is because it shows that they don't know whether or not you're trustworthy. Yeah. And so, yeah, I had to go through that whole little phase and just start, mm -hmm. you know, I think I might've had a few loans back in the day that I just went and got the money with no intention to pay them back. <laughs> and you know, luckily they were so long ago that yeah. it, it was off my credit. It was, right. it was off my credit. So yeah, I think, and that's very important. It is. Know, well, so it's going to be a lot of different things that we will, um, I'm gonna try to get some guests on mm -hmm. who help break down stuff for those in the group, us in the group that we might not understand on right. different topics. Like we talking about, like we talking about credit. You know, it's gonna be a lot. A lot of people want to get out and write books. I mean, that's a that's a thing. Like almost everybody that I got uh, lined up so far on my mm -hmm. uh, re uh, my my son, uh, incarceration, the inspiration. Mm -hmm. virtual conference summit for uh january almost everybody has got a book mm -hmm. almost everybody has wrote a book you know so i think man i just uh feel like uh this is gonna be uh so work in the making but i think if we do it right it's going to be a blessing for a lot of people it will be once they start tuning in and Mm -hmm. start coming in and seeing what this really is all about mm -hmm. and i'm really as i'm like i told denise i can't wait till she's done with her uh yeah study because i really want i really <laughs> want to see what the finding says yeah. i mean and it's, it's crazy some of the things you were saying is actually um what i was getting from some of the participants mm -hmm. when you mentioned about the mentorship only one of them um actually mentioned that so i knew it wasn't going to be at the top but i'm still going to mention it in future implications because that is that is a great idea that is good 
Um, but I just knew that it wasn't going to be in the findings because I'm already knowing through data and analysis that wasn't going to come up because it wasn't mentioned as often as employment and all that other kind of stuff. And, you know, employment, I could tell you now is like top on the list. Yeah, that's gonna be there. That's gonna. That's almost number one. That's why I asked that question. Yeah. Uh, the pro in the in the my groups on Facebook, because I've been building. I wanted when I built the uh podcast, I wanted it to be focused around things that you facing the problems with coming into reentry, things that you know what I'm saying you're gonna be facing the obstacles, um, uh, also the the uh solutions as well. Right. The reason why I know mentorship is, is is on there because I've got a video series of reentry and th things that you're going to face and what you need to do. And one of them is find a mentor. Like I got 10 things that you need to do while looking for a mentor because mm -hmm. having a mentor since I've been home has been a major, mm -hmm. major thing for me, you know, uh, uh, as far as is being able to, somebody's going to tell me the truth, mm -hmm. you know, like, okay, you, if, if, if you feeling that way, go ahead and do it. And then, and then come talk to me on the back end. Right. You know, we got, if you, if you want to go back to the streets, go on, go and do it. I see you on the back end and you can tell me how I go, mm -hmm. you know, somebody's going to say, you know, you're not doing, you, 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 you're doing good, but you can be doing, you can be going yeah. back, you know what I'm saying? Right. So um, the mentors, I got several mentors actually. Um, and I mean, so, but it's important. The importance of having a mentor, someone you can relate to. That, that, like my mentor, I don't know if you all know him, but his name, uh, his name is Andre Norman. He's one of the biggest person in the prison field. Mm -hmm. he has been to pre did 14 years in prison. He, 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 he said, this is what he says, he says I'm a conflict resolutionist. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But he left. He, he when he was in prison, he said he wanted to go to Harvard. And people were telling him like, mm -hmm. yeah, "How you gonna go to Harvard out of prison?" But that's what he did. Okay. And if you being down in um, he he got some program. He is this in the South Carolina prison, uh, Lee County Prison in South Carolina. They just had a stabbing down there. A guy stabbed the guard. Mm. Well, prior to COVID. He had implemented a program in that same prison called the Academy of Hope, where he mm -hmm. went in and he got, they, it was a big ride they had. A lot of guards got stabbed, inmates got stabbed. Mm -hmm. He went in, he said, give me your top 20, the gang leaders, the, the, the worst of the worst in the prison. I'm on them all. I'm going to put them in one dorm and we're going to teach them communication, leadership, yeah. and many other different skills. And he brought in a team of people that's been to prison mm -hmm. before, just like him, that can relate to him. And for, let's say, I think for like 17 months, there was no incident into the whole prison. Then COVID happened and they couldn't get into prison. And mm -hmm. the first incident just happened like a, a week ago. That shows you how important the, the things that he was teaching yeah. and the team was teaching inside of that prison, mentors. They had the mentors with the people that's coming in. was mm -hmm. Really, they mentors. They're teaching them communication, credit, leadership. Yeah. A lot of other different things, and they going. They're not coming in there once a week. Mm -hmm. They going in there every day. Well, you see, so every day they coming in there. So if you ever get a chance, look up on YouTube. Look up Andre Norman in the Academy of Hope, and you know you'll see when you see he ain't in there in no suit, none of that. He's in there with a ball cap and everything, you know. And this is the most dangerous prison in South Carolina, Lee County. And they implement the Academy of Hope, and that shows the importance of it. That's my mentor. He called me. He called me last week. He was like, "What can I help you with? What do you need?" Mm -hmm. I'm like, "Man, just you know, just keep giving me guidance. That's yeah. all I need. You know, but you told me last time I implemented it, it worked. Now I've got to figure out how where to go next. Mm -hmm. That's the importance of mentorship. That you got somebody when you come out that you're connected with somebody that been through what you've been through." Yeah, depending on how you feel and felt when you go to that job and you get that check and half of it, you don't work 40 hours mm -hmm. or 80 hours and you don't make $10 an hour and then taxes don't took a, a third of it and your fees, child support and everything else don't took the other third and now you got to try to maneuver and manage off a third and you got somebody who's been in that situation before that's mentoring you and say, man, I've been there, I already know the feeling. Mm -hmm. This is what you got to do. 
I know what you're thinking, but this is what you this is what you got to do, and this is the way you got to think. You can't think about doing it this way, right? Because we already know as we got we already know how that's gonna work out, how that's gonna end out. You got to start, you know, what I'm saying you got to start doing some decision making. You know, you got to start doing these certain things. Critical yeah. thinking comes into play and all that. So that's the importance of having a mentor when you get out of prison. Oh yeah, because a lot of men get out of prison and they don't have nobody really to sit back and talk to mm -hmm. about what's really going on with them that's been there through their shoes. They're not gonna talk to no PO. I'll definitely want to talk to no PO or no counselor about what's mm -hmm. really you need somebody that you can really just, you know, saying express yourself for real. Exactly. So that way you can get to the base and the underline and the root of it. And then we start working from the root on up. Because once you address the root and you and you you get the root together, that's right. everything else is going to grow solid. That's and right. that's the importance of having a mentor. I mean, to me, I know because the mentor I have, I mean, like, no, tell me, I, I, they weren't going for no uh, caseworker answer. That's why I call it a caseworker answer. <laughs> they want the real answer. No, how you feel, man? I feel like going out there selling dope. Mm -hmm. You know, just be straight up. Yeah, I, I, exactly. I, yeah. And so, yeah, that's the importance of having a mentor, man. Mentorship is a must. You know, and you see the employment and everything is first, mm -hmm. but if you don't have somebody that can kind of navigate you with that, that's feeling you, because when you, appointment, that's going to be one of your major disappointments when you get out. You know what I mean? Doors going to get slammed in your face. Mm -hmm. How many companies they're going to say are feeling friendly? Then when you go fit out, they say, yeah. um, your well, feeling got to be after so many years. Mm -hmm. uh, your felony was within five years, so we can't hire you. At, you know, you got one more year to come back and holler at us. And you're like, man, hold on, I thought you was felon friendly. Right, you know, right. But it got to be after so many years. So that, and see, that's a double-edged sword because if, if, if you committed a felony 10 years ago, okay, you've been locked up for 10 years and you get out and you're trying to get a job, okay, let's just say you finally get an interview after six months of being home, that employer should not hold that against you. And I, I don't, I don't, I've got to do a little research, but from some of the applications that I've seen, when they ask you, have you committed a felony? A lot of them are asking if you've committed a felony within a particular time period exactly so i need to yeah, find out for certain i'm going to talk to a friend of mine who's an attorney if it to been, let's say if it's within seven years but you've been you've been incarcerated for 10 so if you say no you're telling the truth because you've been incarcerated my question is if they do the background check will that be ground and they hire you would that be grounds with an employer to um to terminate your employment you know what i'm saying because it's like yeah. a double -day I think, um it depends on how far they go back into the background check so they say we were hot okay prime example fedex a lot of people don't know that i just found out myself because i went and got me a job with them slid on in there on them and i'm on federal probation <laughs> uh but fedex they only go back a year mm-hmm so when you fill your application out FedEx, it says, have you been convicted of, of a felony or been out of prison or just got out of prison within the last year? Mm -hmm. But that's, see, they don't put that on there. They just, yeah, that, they don't put all the question about yeah, that. That's what, yeah, that's what, that's what FedEx does. Okay. And so when they do their background check, their background check only goes within a year. Okay. But they tell you like, we don't care if you got a felony or not. Uh, we just know where to place you. Like if you got a a, a theft felony, we not right. going <laughs> into <laughs> the, uh, handling the packages. Right, right, right. <laughs> they said if you got a a, a DUI, DWI felonies, we're not going to put you as a driver. Right. You know, but like you said, some companies they got like you know five, seven years. So if you get out and you've been out and you've been locked up ten years. So they do a background check because I had when I first got I had people that did background checks on me and I would you know saying on the application what my crime offense was and the dates mm -hmm. and then they go to look it up and they be like 
uh, I thought you said this. We don't see none of that okay. because it went, it went, it was past how far they looked back. In oh, the, okay, I see. Okay. In the, uh, okay. Cause like now, even like now, all all my all all my felonies don't come up. Just my recent one, my recent one from the fed, when I was in the feds. Mm -hmm. But I have, you know, what I'm saying, call. I've been doing prison time back and forth since 2000. Okay. So cases from 2000 and in between 2000 and 2000, let's say uh 13. Mm -hmm. Them cases don't show up. Them felonies oh, okay. don't show up okay. on the background check. Well, see, that's good to know. That's good to know. And cool. see, I believe about, I want to say about 36 of the states have adopted the ban the box law. And mm -hmm. that what it does is it, it removes that box that you have to check that tells what, that asks you whether or not, you know, you have a criminal record and see what that allows for is if you don't put that box there you uh, you're allowing uh them to and I, I call them formerly incarcerated individuals mm -hmm. i just feel like if i call them I, I don't like the term criminal or something like that because right, i think right. it dehumanizes them but yeah it it allows for them to uh you know to state their qualifications exactly. and you're getting to see that before y'all get to the point to where you ask them if they have a criminal record you know, you get to see their qualifications first because a lot, a lot of times these jobs, they'll kind of, you know, do this stuff at their own discretion. You right. know, when they see it, they, they just won't, they won't go for it. Mm -hmm. Or it's just like any other thing when it's, you know, when they talk about discrimination and it's like, is they, they could be very well discriminating, but if there's a law against them discriminating for a particular thing, then what they can do is just say that you don't meet the qualifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And see, I always feel like when I see the, <laughs> the EEO on the application, mm -hmm. I feel yes. like felon, felon, felonies and felons should be in that category. Mm -hmm. Like you can't discriminate people for this, 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 this. I feel like that should be as mm -hmm. well. I think ban the box is the best play that you can ever have because like you said, it doesn't um you looking at my you looking at my resume and my qualification. You not you, you don't even I don't feel like you should even know whether or not you know I got a felon, I've been convicted of a felon. I also feel that it helps when you ban the box for people that's I get nervous. I'm just gonna be honest with you. When I should fill out application stuff, as soon as I seen that question, all hope just goes out the window. Like that's it. Ah oh, man, here we go. I already know how this is gonna play out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and check it because once you say, have you been convicted of a felony? Yeah, especially on the way you do the application now, it ain't paper, so you online. So now you once you put yes on that, then the box drops. Now you gotta if yes, please describe. And you got to name the offense, the date, you know, and all this other stuff. Like, oh, man, here we go. And you put your offense in there. You don't ever know how somebody is looking at you after they read your offense. They're not looking at you for the person that you are. Now they're looking at you for the offense that you put in there. So let's say if I if I had a, 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 a violent crime mm -hmm. and I put my the nature of the, my violent crime in there. Then they go do the background check and come back and they say, oh man, they, oh no, we can't hire him. I might have be the perfect person for the job. But you going off of a fence that happened, it could be five, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You tripping off that. You, you don't know if I rehabilitated myself, have I changed? Am I that same person? I can be the perfect person for the job. But as soon as you see that box check and the nature of the fence and what comes with it, it's not even about you as a person. No more. It's about you as a, a formerly incarcerated individual. Right. Mm -hmm. And now you did, you know, and I, I, like I said, I get, I know a lot of, I know, I don't know a lot of dudes, but I know with me personally, when I used to uh, check that box, I used to hate seeing it. And when I see it, I'll be it just like it's like an energy taker. Right, right. Like, like boom. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And it just like, but now I got, but I got to the point, I had got to the point where I would be like, uh, 
when I'm talking to them, when they talk about, yeah, do you want to sub an interview? We, we want to offer you the job. I tell them, I just be like, look, I have a felony. The reason why I'm telling you this is because there's no need for us to move forward right? if this is going to come back. I get to work it for a week, and then y'all come back and tell me <laughs> to let you go because you didn't pass the background check. Exactly. So you need to give me the offer and any of that, go do the background check and all that. And if everything clears, then call me back up on the offer because I done, it done happened to me on several occasions where mm -hmm. I done got the offer, I took it, I get to doing the work for about a week. And then they cut, hey man, the background check came back, man, we're gonna have to let you go. Mm -hmm. I should have did that before y'all even got me in here. Exactly, exactly, you know? you're right. So, yeah, I done got, I had got to that point, like I'm just gonna, hey, do the background check first, then come back and holler at me. Yeah. And that, you know what I'm saying? That's just a sad feeling. You thinking you got a job, yeah. You know, you out. You think you got a job, and you in there for a week. That's like playing. That's playing with your. That's playing with your emotions. That's playing. That's you Lord, playing with your emotions. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yes, so yeah, that's a herder. Now you back a square one. That's and that type of stuff will make you be like, you know Forget what? It. Forget Forget it. It. You know, and if you ain't got no mentor or, or no good uh, support group, or you know. That forget it might really be forget it right then and there. Exactly. That's what happens to you more than Which once. Which could lead to recidivism. Exactly. <laughs> Especially if yeah. it happens to you more than once. Like one time, you're like, all right. And it happened to you again. You're like, oh, okay. Three times? I guarantee you it happened to you three times. I'm, I'm going back. to go cook that dope then. <laughs> yeah, it's time, to do something. it's time to get it how I live. That's what's going to happen. That's what happened. One time, okay, I understand. Two times. Time to get back in the lab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how I, I mean, but that, that's, that's how it is, though. Oh, Lord. Back in the lab. Back in the lab. Got to make something happen. Because this, now nah, I ain't going for this. Like, because you, you know, it's like ain't no chance. You know, so yeah, I think that's. They definitely got to get on Missouri. They ain't banning the box. They don't care. They they steady trying to build prisons. I don't know what they got going on. <laughs> They're trying to show you something. Yeah, nah. The governor, he he come on there talking. Man, I I, I turned the TV off on him. I, I man, he, he's just infamous new laws on my tough on crime. <laughs> You're already tough on crime. You can't get no tougher. I don't understand it. You know, uh, you know man. The bottom line is. Personally speaking, it's the it's the dollar. Somebody getting some money under the table for doing, you know, because you have these 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 a lot of these um prisons, these vendors that they that they're working with and what have you. The prison has to um, guarantee so many inmates they have so to they meet can a make quota. Yeah. yeah. They have That's all. It, it's, 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 it's all about to money. receive that funding. <laughs> yep. You know, uh, they sued uh, they a, a couple of businesses, private businesses, private prison-owned businesses, sued the yep. state of Ohio a couple of years ago because in the contractual agreement, when mm -hmm. uh, when they bought Ohio State prisons, the private companies, the mm -hmm. contract agreement was that the state of Ohio was going to keep them ninety-five percent. The capacity. So that's crazy. <laughs> so they wasn't keeping them at they, basically they wasn't keeping them at ninety five percent capacity. So they violated the contract, and so they the private prison people sued them. But see, and that's, that's why it's not about rehabilitating y'all. It's about dollars. That's what it's, it is. It's not about that. rehabilitation. Is there a way to get a hold? It's got to be a way to get a hold to some of these contracts online because I, I i cannot imagine that this is not open um open to the public a lot of them probably have, have, most likely have non-disclosure agreements a lot but, of them probably do. Uh, but i'm talking about the a copy it's, it seems like to me there should be a way to get a hold to the actual contract yeah where you can actually <laughs> see and then because if i can if i if i ever get a hold to one of them and it says 95%, oh, I'm gonna post it on Facebook. I'm posting it everywhere. Oh, I post an article on, it was in the newspaper. That's why I seen it in the news and it was in the newspaper article. I posted it on my, actually I posted it on my Instagram a while back and I mm. I, I had the picture of the, the article 
And then on the on the split screen, I had I was talking about exactly what was going on. Right. I mean, that's what happens. You know, people people they they deal is that you got to keep these. But see, the general public needs to know that because when you start talking about um, um, criminal justice reform, the general public, most of them, they don't know that and they don't understand that this is why the rate for um, for for people being in prison is so high. Is because guess what? They need you to be in prison so that they can make the money. Oh, yeah. You see, according to the Sunshine Laws, that information is supposed to be transparent. You right. are supposed to have access to the information if you ask for it. Any of those um, governing bodies and stuff like what if they're doing that kind of stuff, it's supposed to be made available to the public. Okay. But see, if the public don't know to ask. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But ask, that's what it, uh, that law is really for transparency. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's called the Sunshine Law? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got that one, too. <laughs> We're going to be looking into that. I'm taking notes. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sunshine law. Yeah. I mean, and that's a must. That that is a must. That that's how. It and goes. if you want to look into it, like Missouri has a sunshine law as well. So. Okay. I know you mentioned Missouri. They have a sunshine law. Yeah. Oh, that's they're showing something yeah. now. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So our hour of time is up. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, uh, I'm cool. going to bring this every week. Um, next week, we're going to see if we can get one more person to come in. We can build, <laughs> if, we just, if we just build it up one person a week, you you know, in, in a good time, we're going to be there. This you is know? true. This is true. Yeah. This takes I really time. appreciate, I really appreciate the information. Yeah. I'll stay in touch. And I'll hopefully to see you all back next week to the reentry support group. Y'all have a good evening. All righty. Enjoy I'm going to call you in about five minutes. All right. All right. Talk okay, to you later, good night. All right. Good, good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.